I was thinking about three different messages, as I've said, of what to share this morning. I thought thankfulness would be and gratitude would be a good message to end the year. And, uh, but after that, I, I, I thought a little further and I thought maybe prayer would be a good topic to talk about. But I finally ended and thought that the best way to end this year was to deliver a message from the Word of God in the, in the, with the title, Making Plans God's Way. And because I found that because of the way my year got planned so well, despite all the surprises that ensued, somehow I was able to get back on track. Probably the biggest surprise that happened to my family was my father's stroke, which came at a time that was very unexpected and was very turbulent and very stressful, not, like, not just emotionally, physically, but even financially. But in light of all of that, because of the way the plans were organized, somehow things fell into place. And now as the hours and the minutes of 2017, 2016 tick away, I feel very good about how the year has gone by. And I want to draw your attention to a few things as before I preach here. One is a video that I posted a few weeks ago or last week or, uh, or Tuesday this week. It's entitled, How Do I Know, uh, How do I know uh, That My Plans Are From God? And it's a two-minute video that will help you understand planning God's way. It's, it's a quick video that when you draw up your plans, when I draw up my plans, the first thing I put in my plans is how do I make sure that God does not get out of the equation. In fact, he's the first one that gets into the planning. How do I make sure that I start each day where God is the center of my life? How do I make sure my key vital relationships are in place? How do I make sure that my, my physical health is in check? It's, it's an order of priorities. My finances are planned, yes, but they're kind of like number five in the equation. There's other things that come first before the planning, and this, will, this short video will help you. The other thing that you might want to read is an article my wife wrote at, towards the end of the year called End the Year Fat. And it's a, it's a take on uh, really ending the year with forgiveness, with good accountability, and being very teachable. So those are two quick tips for you. But my message today is really about a story, and I, and I have to forewarn you. It's a little rich. It's very little prescription, a lot of description, a story about two kings, one very old king who's about to die, and the story of another king who's very young, very inexperienced, and is about to step into the greatest role of his life, and the critical thing was how they planned. And I want to say that at the onset to let you know that it doesn't matter how old or how young you are, you are capable of planning as you will see in this story. The story is really about two kings, the king David, who is now at the end of his life. He's about to die. And the powers that be in his kingdom were wrestling with things. In view of that, he had to create plans to make sure that the transfer of power to his son Solomon was done correctly so that the stability of the kingdom of Israel, the nation, would, would flourish and prosper. And we watch this now in the book of uh, First Chronicles, we're reading out of First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 11. Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the portico, for the temple, its buildings, its storerooms, its upper parts, its inner rooms, and the place of atonement. The goal of this message, by the way, is to induce you, to provoke you, to actually make you desire to plan and doing plans God's way. Now, this verse says, David gave his son Solomon the plans, plans for the portico of the temple. His plans did not just involve transfer of power. It involved a lot of different details, its buildings, its storerooms, its upper parts, its inner rooms, and, and the place of atonement. There's, uh, this, if you read through 1 Chronicles 28, you'll find a lot of these plans being executed properly because they were planned way ahead of time. I want to draw your attention to the word plans. Many times as Christians, we feel that if we plan too much, we're keeping God out of the equation, which is contrary to what the Bible teaches. The Bible actually teaches in verse 12, it says, He gave him plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind. Notice that the Bible says that God, the Holy Spirit, is the one who gives us plans. It is actually bad theology to think that God does not like us to plan. In fact, this verse proves that where it actually says, 
he gave him plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind. God wants us to use our minds. God wants us to use our spirits. And the Spirit of God teaches us how to plan properly. Success of our year, hopefully next year, will be more successful than this year because we've learned how to plan according to the Spirit of God. Notice that the treasuries and the temple of God and the the different various parts of the kingdom of God were planned. The monies were planned. Planning is actually spiritual. In fact, the idea of that planning is unspiritual is bad theology. When we think that planning is is not good or is actually not spiritual, we're making a big mistake because the truth of the matter is God is a planner. We find that in a set of different verses in Hebrews 11.10. It says, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. An architect and a builder, their primary job before they actually execute anything is they plan. And the Bible clearly tells us that that's who God is. He is an architect and a builder, in which case he's a planner. More than that, Jeremiah 29 says, verse 11, one of the favorite verses that you and I often quote, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope in the future. Notice that there's one word in this one verse that is repeated three times. And that's the word plans. And as Christians, we have to understand God's invoking us. God's telling us we have to plan. God actually expects us to plan. And the the, the question is why? Why does he want you to plan? And the Bible answers that in, in Psalms 20 verse 4. It says, may he give you the desire of your heart and make what? Plans. Succeed. The reason why we don't see success is because we don't have plans. And because we don't have plans... God has nothing to make us successful with. And so it's good practice. Every every year, I end the year sitting down and making a two-page plan for the year next year. Last year, I decided, in 2015, I decided to entitle that planning system now, Only by Grace. That despite all the planning I tried, the only way this is going to happen is by the grace of God. However, having said that, The first thing that goes in there is my time with God. I've got to have a plan. I've got to make sure that God is not something that's just going to happen by hap chance, but something that I've actually planned and executed on a regular basis. The time I wake up and the time that I sit down and read my Bible and pray, the time that I pray for the nation, the time that I... uh, Actually, one of the biggest victories I had this year because of this plan, believe it or not, is my relationship with my wife, particularly in the area of gift giving. How many of you husbands are often caught in a moment where your anniversary or her birthday or Valentine comes and you didn't have the gift and you forgot? Well, this year, I was ahead of the game because I planned. In fact, at Christmas time, I had the most poggy points, if you may, the biggest of medals, and my wife had the most brilliant of smiles because I had one gift after the other well executed because it was well planned. Planning works. It's actually a good thing. Now, it's not necessarily because I'm a good guy that I ended up giving good gifts. It's because I had good plans that actually made me become a good guy. It's interesting how God works these things and how these things overlap. Planning, a very important facet of our Christian faith. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purposes that will prevail. In other words, we can only plan so much, but at the end of the day, God will redirect. And that's the beauty of having a plan, because when you plan, then you have a list that you can actually pray for on a daily basis. So I sit down and pray for this, 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 pray for Duterte, pray for uh, my my friend who's who's now the Secretary of of, of, uh, Energy, I pray for different people, pray for members of the church, pray for the apostolic team of the church. I get to pray for all kinds of things because they're in my plan. And here's the beautiful thing about that. When the plans happen, then I scream hallelujah and say, God answered my prayers. And when the plans don't happen, I scream hallelujah and said, God, you knew exactly not to make me have that. I'll give you a case in point. I took an exam to take a master's degree this year, last, uh, last year, worked hard for it, took the exam and passed it, 
but by some stroke of God, was prevented from taking the course. Instead of regretting it, I was actually rejoicing because I knew that God answered my prayer. Amen? When you have a plan, peace envelopes your heart. When you have a plan, your mind is clear. Your work is clear because you're not thinking just of one year. You're actually thinking of successive years because you understand that in the midst of those plans, God's purposes will still prevail. Now, back to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. He gave him instructions for the divisions of the priests and the Levites for all the work of the serving of the temple of the Lord as well as for all the articles and that he used in its service. Now, notice these words that have to be part and parcel of a plan. A plan is useful to you and me because when you have a plan, you can give clear instructions. It's easy to give people instructions. So my, my father had a stroke, and the fact of the matter is because I travel so much, as much as I want to be there every single day or every single hour, I can't. But because plans are clear and because I can give clear instructions, there are nurses and maids and doctors and helpers and, and people who can make things work. Many times the reason why life doesn't work for us or the people around us, our families, our children, or the people who help us get confused about us is because we don't have clear plans. And as Christians, I invoke you. I'm persuading you. I'm pushing you. You need to plan. You need to have good plans, long plans, plans according to God, because you can't make life work without other people. And you're going to have to be able to give instructions to people, and that's what David was saying. He gave him instructions, and he gave him clarity of thought, because when you're not clear about your plans, people are confused. The people around you don't really know what's happening. Simple things become complicated because you didn't plan ahead, so to speak. Now, notice it says the divisions. In other words, a plan allows you to create teams. The clearer you are about your plans, the easier it is to build teams. When you think about teams, often when you mention the word team, the first thing that comes to mind would be sports. And it's a very simple reason why sports is the clearest manifestation of teamwork. That's because the goals and the rules are clear. It's easy to plan when your goals and the rules, and by the way, in a sporting event, there's a deadline. There's a start and an end. When you're clear about your plans, when you know the rules and the goals, and you know the beginning and the deadline, by the way, if you don't have a deadline, forget planning because it doesn't work. It's kind of like writing an email that you never get to write for weeks, and then when somebody says the deadline's today, it gets done in five seconds. Deadlines are powerful. Plan, folks. God wants you and I in this limited time on earth. As I've gone through all the different wakes and funerals of the year, the more the conveyance of the message that life is short. Thus, we need to plan even more to make sure that we make impact on this world the way God intended it to be. Now, the verse continues where it says, the work, there's work to be done. In other words, allows us to determine how much work do I really have to put in here? How many hours do I have to work? And it also tells us that the, the, the deadlines to be set because of the plan. And finally, it says the articles, the use of resources. How much will this cost? How much money do I need? What sort of transport will I need to move this thing? The details of this plan come to life. I'm, 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 I'm here, I said, I, I, I forewarned you that this is a little rich of a message, but my goal is not to prescribe this to you. My goal is to inspire you that this is necessary for you, for your family, for the things you value, for the things that are important to you, for your relationships, for your health, for your finances. Planning, scriptural truth, a very important part of our faith, I believe. Now, elements of a good plan are detailed in the further chapters of 1 Chronicles 28. 
Here, David designated the weight of the gold for all the gold articles to be used in the various kinds of service with the weight of the silver for all the silver articles to be used. In this next set of verses, we find the repetition of this word weight. The idea of planning involves weighing things, to measure things properly, so that the plans, although not explicit, can be at some point workable. Now, weight means what's valuable to you. Planning begins with the most important values in your life. Your time with God is not going to happen unless you accurately plan for it. I've got a sheet of paper that I call my VUCA habit. When I wake up in the morning, that falls in front of me, and it says the verses I'm going to read. And at the back of that are the prayers that I pray for my wife and my children, and the prayers that I pray for our nation, the nations of the world. I had some Nigerians here this morning, and I was telling them, for years I prayed for your nation because of the genocide that's being, do being done to the Christians there. Prayer happens when we plan. And when we pray, peace comes to us because when things happen, as I've said, then we rejoice because we know we prayed for it. And when it doesn't happen, we still rejoice because we know that God knows it and He's either delaying it or actually preventing it from happening. Values, the values of your relationship, planning the moments that you're going to have with your children, your spouse, the people that are important to your life, your health. One of my goals this year is I want to learn how to wall climb. I don't know if my 59-year-old body can still, oh, 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 I don't know if I can still do that. But I can at least give it a try. And I think if I just plan a little bit better, I just might. I just might be able to kayak. I just might be able to do other things. Because planning eliminates the periphery. It eliminates the wasted time. It eliminates the moments in YouTube that you shouldn't be spending on. But looking at the real values. By the way, I'm developing a message called TQ. It's called Technology Quotient, in hopes that I can teach Christians to not just have IQ and SQ and IQ and all of these Qs, but to have the quotient to manage technology. Do you know that there's now a brand new disease called the Blackberry Thumb? It's a brand new disease. They found out that people who have lower back pain is caused by using too much of the iPad and the iPhone. They don't have TQ. Fact of the matter is, I am on social media seven days a week, 365 days a, a year. I'm on Facebook. I've, I've got a post on Facebook every single day of the year. That's the truth. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I've got a website. But the truth is, I'm on the internet at the most, and I am very honest with you, at the most 10 to 15 minutes a day. Because technology does not enslave me. Technology is my slave. It doesn't tell me what to do. I tell it what to do for me. It doesn't waste my time on what's not valuable. I only use it to develop the things that I value and develop them even more. Values is the beginning of how you make the right plans. Secondly, it's not just values, but the priorities. What is the thing that has the greatest weight? that's become the real priority of our lives, the most important things that we need to put in the plan first. And a lot of the things that don't have the value and the weight or the priority need to actually be dispensed off if necessary. We're now living in an over-informed world with too much information. The trick is not even to know more. The trick is to, to how to dispense of more and keep the most valuable and the ones that are to be most prioritized. Finally, it says the weight of the gold in the lampstands and the weight of each of the lampstands. Again, this mention of weight and three other weights that you might want to consider when you're making a plan. Plants need to have resources. You need to weigh those. Plants don't need just have the resources. They need to measure the load. How, much, how heavy is this? Am I overdoing it? Am I spending too much? Am I have left no more margins for my day? Or have I used my margins for things I shouldn't be using it for? Planning. And more than just wait, it also deals with specifics. Can't make a plan without being specific. What is the goal and how do you want to fulfill that goal? It's important.
to make plans. Verse 19 says, all this, everybody say, all this. In other words, David was complete. He did it all this. And he said this, I have it in writing. This thorough plan I have, I've got it down on paper. It's not just in my head. I actually sit down and write this thing, he said. If you don't write it down, I, I, I don't like planning on an iPad or an iPhone because I like the smell of paper. And I like the feel of the texture. And I like the pressing of the pen and the paper because it moves certain faculties in me. It makes me smell the paper, smell the ink. It, it reminds me of these plans. And after I've done that, I start typing it in. You don't have to do it. I'm, like I said, I'm not prescribing to you. I'm just describing. When I do my quiet time, I don't do it on an iPad. or an, I use a regular Bible because I don't want to be distracted. And I write my notes and my prayers every day. If you go to my Facebook site, four times a week, I post prayers that I write on a fairly regular basis. Planning. A very important thing that God wants to put in our lives because He wants us, the people of God, to impact this world. I have it in writing, he says. I've put it in writing. It's clear to me. Not just that, it gives me the understanding in all of the details. Planning requires not just the, 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 the revelation and the big idea and the concept. It requires details. How do you intend to do that? Where are you going to get the time to do that? What are you giving up so that you can do that? The details are important when we plan. Finally, David said to Solomon, and this is the part that most preachers preach about without preaching the first part, which is just as important as the first part, if not more important. He says, after we have made all these plans, and Solomon asks you, execute these plans. These are not just things on paper. You're going to need a lot of strength, and you're going to need a lot of courage. You're going to need to face 2017 with courage, with faith, with strength to believe that despite how old I am or how young I am, I'm going to see these things happen. Despite the setbacks I have and despite the limitations, despite what's going on in my nation, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Planning involves, as I've said, prayer. And one of the most important things you need to plan for, folks, whenever you're hit with surprises, unexpected surprises, is the ability to meditate on God's Word. I'm nursing a cough right now, and I've had it for a few days, and typically these things run for days, but I tried this the other day, and, I, and, I, and again, I'm not prescribing, I'm simply describing, and I knew that I was going to cough the whole night, typically, as this happens to me. And I started to meditate on a very simple verse. I, not my wife, not my children, not my neighbors, not Steve Merle, not John Neron, not Alan, I can, not can't, not won't, not might, I can do. This is going to happen. I can make this happen. All, my sickness, my sleep, all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I kept repeating that and meditating. My mind was resting and saying, I'm going to not sleep. I'm going to get tired. I'm going to lose my voice. I won't be able to preach on Sunday. Your mind wrestles and runs ahead of you. Pause for a minute and plan to meditate on that word day and night as Joshua 1.8 says. Stop that mind from running ahead. Make a plan this year that whenever you're faced with whatever surprise there may be, the plan is I meditate on His Word day and night. I press pause on that mind and begin to think about the Word of God in my life. That way, you become courageous and you become strong. Then it says, do the work. After we've planned and after we've become strong and after we've become courageous, we need to work. If you don't like to work, I can't help you. Amen? <laughs> Sorry. But we need to. We need to get up there and do the thing that we need to do. 
and make it happen. Then he says, do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God, the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you until the work of the service of the temple is finished. Notice what he says. Do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid. Don't let whatever issues are going on around you, don't let whatever surprises are going on around you, don't let them worry you. You're going to need faith. Faith to believe that whatever happens, God is with you and God is for you. And God is going to cause all things to come together for your good. In fact, it is faith that compels you to plan. Because if God indeed has good things in store for me, then I should be the first one to be planning. In fact, it's faith that should be waking you up in the morning because if this day was meant to be a great day, then I should be up today maximizing this day. Faith is a necessary component of planning. We don't just put things to paper, but we actually believe that God is for us and not against us and has good things in store for us. Finally, it says, all the work of the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. In other words, finish the work. Don't stop short. There will be surprises. My last funeral was last Wednesday. Very interesting funeral because it was so unexpected. We had to put to the ground the remains of the father of one of my friends who actually was in my home the night that my father had a stroke. He was in my home, and the night my father had a stroke, he literally helped me put my father in an ambulance and bring my father to a hospital. And the turmoil, by the way, the turmoil of watching your father fight for life is not an easy thing. But the meditating of God's Word, the eternal life that God has given him, and the thoughts of that and going in and out of that room is what kept me. But the surprise was, when I got back from Singapore, it was my friend's father who actually passed away ahead of my father. And last Wednesday, we had to be in the funeral. Surprises come and surprises happen. I watched my friend stand there, a Christian, a devout follower of Christ, I was telling my sons about this. You know, in my, I've learned some pointers from him about how to process this. And folks, let me tell you something. The reason why you have to plan is precisely because this life is brief. And the better the plans are, the better the impact gets. Surprises are going to both be bad and good. My last surprise happened actually this morning. I walked to the church. Johnny C., who's one of our ushers, walked up to me and said, Pastor, I have a surprise for you. He shook my hand, and in his hand was this tiny little bottle. He says, because I know you like hot sauce a lot, you now have a portable Tabasco. (laughs) Surprises are from God, and they're great. And believe it or not, God's got a lot of them, both good and bad. It doesn't mean we shouldn't plan. Amen? Would you stand on your feet as we close in a word of prayer? Father, thank you for this coming year. Just be still before the Lord. Just put your hands in your hearts. If you're here today and you've never heard the preaching of God's Word and the truth that Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead to give you the ability to hear the power and the truth of His Word, If you're here today and that's you, you're just visiting. God wants to save you today. He wants to give you eternal life. He wants to give you the revelation of who He is and the truth of His Word. If that's you, as every eye is closed, would you just lift up your hand very quickly? I want to pray for you. Anybody at all? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. You can put your hands down. That's not what's going to save you. Here's what's going to save you. If you pray this prayer in your heart, just follow after me. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, just where you're sitting, where you're standing, thank you. 
thank you for this morning. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the revelation of truth. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to reveal the sins of the past that I might repent and turn away from them. And God, I ask you to come into my heart as I receive your grace, your mercy, and your salvation. I'm doing this by faith, stepping into the realm of the eternal, believing that in you, I'm born again of the Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. For the rest of us, let's just pray a prayer. The Holy Spirit, oh God, you would reveal the plans that you have for us. Even as your word has said, you have plans to prosper us. Plans not to harm us, plans to give us success. I'm asking you, God, make us a people who know how to plan your way. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen.